All righty, history fans, welcome to the very first lecture in History 30, the first of what I hope will be just two recorded lectures. Hopefully we will be back on campus and in the classroom soon learning together, but we begin the quarter remotely and we begin the quarter with this very first recorded lecture, which will begin our examination of the 1980s in 1980, fittingly. And in this lecture, we'll talk about a number of trends in this period that ultimately culminate in November of 1980 with the election of Ronald Reagan and the beginning of the Reagan era. So in this first lecture, we'll examine the year 1980. We'll talk about some trends in American society and culture in 1980 and really set the stage for many of the insights we'll develop across the quarter as we examine the 1980s together. So grab a piece of paper, a pen, pencil, whatever you like to take notes with, buckle up, because here we go, launching back to 1980. In the 1970s, there were a series of crises in America that really rocked the American psyche. You had Watergate, you had the loss in Vietnam and the disastrous end of a disastrous war in Vietnam. And then you had a beleaguered economy where America in the 1970s saw the end of the post-World War II expansion and a new economy marked by deindustrialization with factories closing and massive layoffs in the industrial sector, the rise of a service sector economy, which offered low pay, low prestige, no benefit jobs, replacing those once uh, good paying jobs in industry. You saw competition from abroad with the rise of Germany, Japan, and other nations that were now true rivals to America's standing in the global economy. And then you had a number of domestic crises within the United States in the 1970s, uh, racial divisions fueled by some of the changes unleashed by the civil rights revolution of the 1960s. Uh, the gender politics 1970s was very divisive with the rise of uh, an increasingly assertive feminism changes to the American workplace with more and more women entering the workplace, and also many debates about American families in the 1970s that came with the advent of no-fault divorce and rising divorce rates that changed how Americans both perceived and experienced the American family ideal. So the 1970s was a time of tumult, of change, of a sense of decline in many ways, with decline of American authority, with the loss in Vietnam, a decline in faith and in institutions with not just Watergate, but a number of other public scandals, a sense of fear, a sense of conspiracy that often manifest in media stories about satanic cults and other uh, dark forces that abounded in this period. We're gonna see this a lot in this class, the sort of residues of a 1970s conspiracy mindset that bleeds into a lot of the fears 1980s. But we begin here in the late 70s, early 80s with uh, my testimony that the 1970s was a time where many Americans, because of these changes, this tumult, the decline of American authority and power scandals, um, there's a sense in America in the late 70s that the American dream was in decline, that America's authority had in many ways diminished, that dark, sinister forces had manifest throughout the nation. And so you had, going into the election of 1980, a long accumulation of a sensibility, fears, anxieties within the 1970s that supported this view that America's best days were behind it and darker days lie ahead. In 1979, as we'll talk about, there'll be a major crisis in the American economy that comes with the revolution in Iran, another oil boycott and spiking gas prices and with it massive inflation throughout the American economy. But that development in 1979 into early 1980 was also built again on accumulation of economic woes that rippled through the 1970s with deindustrialization, the decline of good paying union jobs in industries like uh, automotive industries, steel industries. In the 1970s, those good paying jobs were evaporating and often replaced 
by low pay, low prestige jobs in the service sector. The 1970s is really the beginning of a great shift in the American economy away from an economy centered on people living in cities, working in factories, turning bolts and producing tangible goods to what we have now, a service sector economy with two tiers, a high end and a low end. And many people who saw factories close, saw the loss of their employment in the industrial sector found themselves now working in low pay, low prestige jobs. So that's a broad trend that spans the 1970s, deindustrialization, the decline of good paying industrial jobs, deunionization, the rise of competition abroad. And then at the very end of the 1970s, you have the crisis that we'll talk about in just a moment in 1979 into 1980. And all of this amplifies again, the other markers, signals of fear, alarm in the country, in American society, American culture. So you have these economic woes, you have a media that in the 1970s amplified a number of stories about crime, about corruption, um, serial killers, and uh, these very scandalous events that deepened America's sense that indeed our best days are behind us. You had the loss in Vietnam, you had in the late 70s, as we'll talk about in a moment, the invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviets, which seemed to indicate that they had returned to a much more aggressive bellicose posture, that the fears of confrontation with the Soviet Union uh, were justified and revived. And then of course, the revolution in Iran and the resulting Iranian hostage crisis. So we begin our survey of the 1980s by indicating one of the key dynamics we'll talk about here in the class that will be reinforced in the lectures and the movies we watch, in the readings that I've selected, there is coming out of the 1970s and into the early 1980s and really spanning the totality of that decade, a sense of fear alarm in America that spans economics, politics, culture, and society. And the conservative movement led by Ronald Reagan and others was very skilled at tapping into those sense, that sense of fear. Uh, fear that our economy was in the doldrums, that the American dream was slipping away, that it was harder and harder for Americans to buy a home, send their kids to college and live the American dream of fear. That American power and prestige had declined, that we would never again accomplish the goals that we had accomplished early in the Cold War. Now we faced the psychological trauma, of the loss in Vietnam, amplified by other setbacks like the Iranian hostage crisis. And then of course, fears domestically about a changing America in regards to gender roles, family life, morality, race, crime. The 1980s, continues what began in the 1970s, the sense of fear that permeated America. And the conservative movement led by Reagan was very adroit at amplifying those fears and blaming liberals and other scapegoats for those crises, but at the same time, offering themselves as an antidote to the sense of American decline. So what we'll see going forward in this lecture and lectures to come and so many of the artifacts we will engage with from the, this period, the 1980s, is this interesting interplay within the conservative movement throughout the 1980s in American cultural texts, movies that we'll watch in this class that interlace fear and hope where there's a great deal of emphasis on a sense of America imperiled, endangered by dark, sinister forces, whether they are abroad or within the nation, whether they are economic, social, cultural, religious, moral, combined with a sense that Reagan, the conservative movement, its prescriptions are the only hope for combating these threats and fears. So as we go forward in this lecture, as we go forward in this class, be keenly aware of the prominence of fear of narratives of decline in 1980s America, that conservatives were very skilled at mining and developing as part of their argument that the only hope for America 
the only prospects of renewal and vanquishing these forces lie with that conservative movement. Alrighty, let's now dig deeper and talk about some specific examples of the fears in America in the election year of 1980. And we begin with the Iranian Revolution. In the 1950s, the United States removed a democratically elected president of a now independent, independent nation, Iran, when Mohammad Mosadi was elected president of an independent Iran in the early 1950s, he threatened to nationalize the oil industry in Iran, which was controlled and dominated by British and American corporations. By nationalizing, he would seize those assets of foreign companies in the name of the Iranian people, arguing that these uh, oil fields, oil deposits should benefit the Iranian people as they are within our boundaries. United States, in uh, reaction to that threat, and particularly in the context of the Cold War, that saw such actions of nationalization of private industry, nationalization of private property as evidence of communism, conspired to remove Mohammad Mosadi in a CIA-sponsored coup and replace him with a monarch, the Shah. So since the 1950s, the United States had supported the Shah of Iran. The Shah was a leader of Iran who was allied with the United States in the Cold War era, opposed to Soviet Union. He was a monarch who ruled without the consent of the Iranian people. He had been imposed upon them by the U.S. government who had removed a leader, Mosadi, who had been democratically elected, who did enjoy the consent of the governed. And so there was a longstanding policy in Iran of support for this monarch, the Shah, who was a repressive dictator who often abused his people, incarcerated his critics, stole and aggrandized his own personal wealth from the Iranian people, but enjoyed the support of the United States particularly in the Cold War, where we were concerned about Soviet influence, not just around the world, but particularly in the oil-rich area of Southwest Asia or the Middle East. But there was a growing movement in the 1970s opposed to the Shah and with it opposed to American intervention in Iran. This is an important point about the Iranian Revolution that to this day it's often seen through the lens of religion and religion certainly played a key role in the Iranian Revolution. But it is not solely about religion. Now, the Shah uh, was a strong opponent of religious fundamentalism. He saw himself as a leader of a modern secular state in Iran. Um, and that angered religious leaders in Iran who wanted a theocracy or a government that was much more in line with Islamic teachings and traditions. So the Shah was repressive against religious expression within Iran, and that fueled the religious side of the opposition movement to the Shah. But the opposition movement to the Shah was also an opposition movement to U.S. meddling in Iran that had po uh, put the Shah in place. So there's both a secular and a religious element to the anti-Shah popular movement that rose up in 1979 and uh, sparked this revolution in Iran that would remove the Shah and uh, lead to an Iran now led by religious leaders, namely the Ayatollah Khomeini. So in 1979, there's a revolution in Iran against the Shah, against American rule or American influence in Iran. It did have a religious basis to it and led to what remains to this day, a theocracy in Iran, where leaders are religious leaders, first with the Ayatollah Khomeini. So in 1979, there's this revolution in Iran, in a part of the world that America had long influenced, a part of the world that America had long seen as it's to order and manipulate, both because of Cold War concerns and because of concerns about the global oil supply. But there in Iran, uh, you have this revolution and the removal of an American sponsored regime and now a regime that is openly hostile to the United States. As part of this revolution, 
the American embassy in the capital of Iran, Tehran, is seized and American State Department officials there in the embassy are held hostage. So this was an absolute catastrophe and crisis that symbolized American weakness, symbolized threats, symbolized the declining power and authority of the United States in 1979. This was a shock to what had prevailed up until the Iranian Revolution, a Cold War framework that tended to see international crises through the lens of communism versus capitalism, the United States or the Soviet Union. Here was a movement that was very different. It was religious in its origins, uh, nationalistic. It sort of defied the way in which we had come to see the world for 40 years since the end of World War II. And with it came, again, a sense that we were ill-prepared to deal with the challenges around the globe. So the Iranian Revolution, in and of itself, was menacing, threatening, indicative of American decline and impotence. It was also a threat because it seemed to indicate that the United States was perceiving the world in a false way and ill-prepared for the challenges that surround the nation. And so when the revolution takes place in Iran, in uh, 1979, the latter stage of the Carter administration, there's a widespread sentiment in America that this represents a decline of American authority on top of, again, the many other foreign policy setbacks that preceded it, like the loss in Vietnam. And so in 1979, Business Week publishes a edition with a picture of the Statue of Liberty on the cover crying. And the headline was The Decline of U.S. Power. Time magazine named the Ayatollah Khomeini the man of the year. And as we've learned recently, time uh, often honors, if you can use that verb, someone as man or now person of the world who isn't necessarily a person of moral uh, standing and fame and probity, but just whoever was the most prominent and important figure of that era. Uh, most recently, Time named um, the head of Tesla the person of the year, and you can make your own judgment about the worthiness of Elon Musk. And in the controversy that swirled Musk being declared the person of the, world of the year, a lot of reportage cited that Hitler was once named man of the year. Um, and the 1979, another infamous figure, the Ayatollah Khomeini, was recognized as man of the year. And that's because he was so consequential in this major global shift that was, again, perceived as a great threat, a great blow against American authority. Another domestic manifestation of the revolution in Iran, um, this led to a massive oil boycott by OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries that were sympathetic to the fundamentalist movement, uh, anti-American movement in Iran. And so there's an oil boycott, which meant that OPEC, this organization of petroleum exporting countries, most of which are located in the Middle East, cut off the supply of oil. And that meant oil prices rose by 50%. It led to spikes in the price of gasoline. It led to long lines, like you see in this photograph here from 1979, of people waiting desperately to buy a few gallons of gas. And so the Iranian revolution affected the American economy. It was uh, a sign that not only was America weak and vulnerable around the globe, particularly with the hostage crisis that comes out of this, as we'll talk about in the next slide, but also weak and vulnerable here at home because our economy was so dependent on cheap gas that the American consumer worker was so vulnerable to these fluctuations in prices it was yet another sign that America had lost its way. America um, was in decline. The American dream was slipping away, again, on top of all the other crises that preceded it. It also led to this very kind of bellicose, uh, jingoistic, militaristic sens sensibility in America. There were bumper stickers that said, nuke their ass and take their gas. There were right-wing movements that published posters that uh, featured an image of a mushroom cloud with the caption, how much is gas now? It was a poster that many uh, right-wing movements 
produced and circulated in America in 1979 indicating we should, I guess, nuke them and destroy their gas, but that would somehow make gas cheaper, I don't know. Um, but in response to the sense of American decline, there was a sort of bellicose right-wing response captured in bumper stickers that said things like, nuke their ass and take their gas. And then in March of 1979, there was a major disaster near meltdown at a nuclear power plant here inside the United States, the Three Mile Island disaster. And that seemed to again indicate American vulnerability in regards to energy, incompetence, uh, fears of a potential massive uh, destructive event that could come with such a nuclear meltdown. Um, 1979 was a very challenging year in regards to energy, the economy, and again, overall, the psychological and symbolic impact of this that confirmed America was weak, vulnerable, had lost its way, incompetent. Wall Street Journal uh, wrote an article that called Jimmy Carter, President of the United States in 1979, who will run for re-election against Ronald Reagan in 1980, a woman president. And so there's this ugly sexism that surrounds the Carter administration and the way in which he was attacked by right-wing conservative publications like Business Week or the Wall Street Journal. Uh, in a Wall Street Journal article, in response to this revolution in Iran, Jimmy Carter was called weak, effeminate, and, quote, a woman president. So you see in response to the revolution in Iran, this criticism of Carter that blames him for this setback, the consequences it brings for American consumers and the American economy, and indulges in this ugly sexism by implying that Carter is unmanly, that he's not aggressive and masculine in the way in which Wall Street Journal in the 1970s might imagine masculinity, um, and then uh, represents him as effeminate and, quote, a woman president. This is very indicative of the rhetoric that surrounded Carter as he ran for election in 1980 amidst these crises. And along with this deliberate effort to frame him as weak and effeminate is this figure of contradistinction, Ronald Reagan, who talked tough, who talked about a much more aggressive, assertive foreign policy in a very masculinized fashion. So as we began this lecture, I noted you have to see this interplay between uh, crises, a sense of failure, in this case, criticism of Carter as effeminate, and the antidote that's offered by conservatives like Reagan, who are more than willing to play into this sexism and assert themselves as bold, masculine, aggressive leaders who could uh, remedy the problems associated with Carter, who is represented as a quote unquote woman president. So it's 1979, there's a revolution in Iran and the revolution itself crackles with all of this imagery of America weak in decline. There's the effects of the revolution here at home, in gas lines, in spikes, in inflation and consumer prices, a sense of an American economy vulnerable to foreigners who literally had us over a barrel, the barrel of oil. There's a way in which it amplifies right-wing critiques of Carter. And then in July of 1979, amidst this crisis where Americans are being held hostage in an embassy in Tehran, Carter goes on television and gives a speech that he hoped would buoy American spirits and confidence and rally us to this next challenge. It's referred to as the Malays speech, even though he never uses the word Malays in the entire speech. And that really speaks to the way in which Carter was so successfully framed and represented by conservatives and critics so that the speech, which doesn't involve the word Malays, is remembered to this day as the Malay speech. Right-wingers, conservatives, were so successful in defining Carter that this speech is to this day understood to be the Malays speech, even though he doesn't use that word. Instead, Carter saw this speech as one that would speak soberly and frankly to Americans about the crises and challenges we are facing and urge them to see within themselves 
through introspection, a way to bolster the nation and go forward. It was really designed to be a speech that offered a very sober, frank critique of the challenges we face, but also inspire us to put aside our selfishness, our individualism, and rally together as a nation. But that's not how it was framed, and it's not how it was perceived. Many saw the crisis and confidence speech, later erroneously known as the Malay speech, as Carter conceding to the fact that we were a nation in decline, as charging Americans with being self-absorbed. Carter was deeply influenced by a very influential book that was published in 1979 called The Culture of Narcissism, written by Christopher Lash. And Lash was reflecting on the 1970s, a decade that's often known as the me decade, and seeing Americans as becoming selfish, self-absorbed, no longer committed to community, society. And Carter was deeply influenced by that book, and he saw himself as a president who could rally the American people to band together with a sense of us, which involved sacrifice. It involved conservation of energy and scarce resources. That was Carter's message in this July 1979 speech. But it was perceived by Americans as Carter conceding to the fact that we were now weaker, less powerful, less able to control global events, blaming the American people rather than institutions or, again, nefarious forces around the nation, around the world for America's problems, and urging Americans to sacrifice, to go without, to accept a America in decline. And so Carter's speech, though designed to rally the American people, backfired. And it was perceived as critical, as Carter himself accepting America's decline and urging Americans to accept less rather than more. And again, this would really play into Reagan and conservative hands who will offer a message that America doesn't have to apologize, America doesn't have to go without, that we're not selfish and individualistic for our pursuit of consumer goods and a quality of life. So we'll talk about here in this lecture and going forward, the 1980s was a period where Americans embraced individualism, embraced a consumerist lifestyle, embraced a vision of abundance and hedonism. And when Carter was perceived as an enemy to those urges and impulses, well, it further sunk his standing with the American people. Within the drama of the Iranian Revolution was another drama, the Iranian hostage crisis. When in 1979, there is this revolution in Iran that will remove an American-sponsored government and create a theocracy hostile to the United States. As part of that, the American embassy in Tehran is seized and 52 American State Department workers would be held hostage from 1979 right up until the inauguration of Ronald Reagan in early 1981. This is the Iranian hostage crisis, where 52 American citizens are held as hostages by the new government in Iran. They were represented in American media, blindfolded, their hands tied behind their backs, weak, menaced by young revolutionaries with assault rifles, this was dramatic evidence of the weakness, vulnerability of Americans in the late 1970s and through the election year of 1980. It's hard to overstate the impact of the Iranian hostage crisis. Every night on television, the network news, the major source of news for most Americans in the late 70s, early 80s, counted the days of these Americans held hostage. It was a daily reminder, a daily reminder of American weakness and vulnerability. And in those television reports, time and time again, the Americans who were held hostage, represented as weak, blindfolded, menaced by these young revolutionaries, were represented through the lens of family. And by that I mean 
they were literally represented as uh, family members. There were interviews with the wives, children of those held hostage, and they pleaded on camera for the release of their husbands, their fathers, their sons. And so Americans came to see this crisis through the lens of family because rather than being represented as State Department officials, um, people employed by the U.S. government and enforcing the American foreign policy in Iran that the revolution targeted, rather than being represented in that way as emissaries of the American government and uh, those enforcing this American policy, they were represented as innocent family members, innocent Americans. They were represented as husbands, sons, fathers. And this really deepened the psychological impact of the crisis. Furthermore, there was a deliberate effort to represent them as part of an American family, to urge Americans watching this crisis play out night after night after night on the nightly news to identify with these held with these people held captive. They were seen as our fellow American citizens, members of that American family. And what this does is it not only deepens the connection between American viewers and those held captive, but it unites Americans in a common sense of loss, grief, weakness, and vulnerability on top of all the other consequences of the Iranian Revolution. And these images of people held captive, people imprisoned, reverberated with other images that had circulated for years in America in the 1970s with those left behind in the fall of Saigon at the end of the American war in Vietnam, who would be held captive by the North Vietnamese and tortured for their complicity and support of the American effort there. After the end of the American war in Vietnam, almost immediately stories would circulate of Americans who were left behind, American soldiers who had been captured by the North Vietnamese army, prisoners of war, and that would begin what continues to this day, the symbolism of the POW movement, of this idea that there are Americans who are being held, tortured, abused, who are left behind, members of an American family that demand reunion. And so well before the Iranian revolution, the hostage crisis of 1979, Americans for some time had been conditioned to think in this way about loss, Greece, grief, and a disconnect between the American family owing to the POW movement. And then in the 1970s, there were a series of uh, stories about cults, and we'll talk a lot about cults and fear of Satanism and satanic panic prevails in the 1980s building on these uh, media reports and uh, events of the 1970s, cults, satanic panic, fear of manipulation by nefarious forces, very common in the fear that spanned the 70s and 1980s. There was, of course, Jonestown, the uh, People's Temple, where Jim Jones, who had led that uh, church in San Francisco in the 1970s, uh, fearing Prosecution flees to Guyana, convinces hundreds of his supporters to travel there with him. And then when um, he murders a congressman, Leo Ryan, and fears that he will soon be arrested and prosecuted, urges the members of his group to commit mass suicide in Guyana in the late 70s. So the image of um, these Americans held hostage in Tehran was again built upon accumulation of images that span from the loss in Vietnam, the residue of the effects of America's loss in Vietnam and the POW movement, and the various cults of the 1970s, where there was a sense that Americans were being abducted, held captive within this nation by nefarious forces represented by figures like Jim Jones. And so the Iranian hostage crisis is not a singular event. It's connected to a lot of deep-rooted fears, anxieties in America in this period built upon that. 
Then in the same year of 1979, the Soviets invade Afghanistan. So you have the revolution in Iran. You have the resulting hostage crisis with all the meanings associated with it. And then you have at the end of that year, the Soviets invading an independent sovereign nation, Afghanistan, which ultimately will prove to be an absolute disaster for the Soviet Union. Many people argue that the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan's efforts to control that nation, that's the Soviet Union's Vietnam, a massive foreign policy failure that would lead to the weakening of the Soviet Union, and many argue ultimately the demise of the Soviet Union in the late 80s and early 1990s. Many argue that the Soviets' invasion of, of Afghanistan would hasten the end of the Soviet Union. It would indeed prove to be an absolute disaster akin to America's efforts in Vietnam in the 1960s and 1970s. But at the time, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was perceived in a very different way as a symbol of Soviet recalcitrance, Soviet bellicosity, Soviet aggression. Through the 1970s, the US government, the administrations of Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, and Jimmy Carter had all to a varying extent embraced the philosophy of detente, which was an effort to open relations with the Soviet Union and communist China, ratchet down aggression and hostility, work with this other superpower to limit the prospects of confrontation and potentially a nuclear war. And at the end of that strategy that prevailed in the 1970s of detente, you get the Soviet aggression against a sovereign nation, Afghanistan. Ultimately, this will be a huge failure for the Soviet Union. But at the time, it was seen that the Soviets were a threat, that they were a menace, that detente had failed. And so when Reagan comes along and says, we need to be more aggressive against the Soviet Union, we need to challenge them when he calls them an evil empire, that really resonates with Americans. So in addition to the Iranian Revolution, the hostage crisis in 1979, you have this exhibit of aggression by the Soviet Union, which only deepens the criticisms against Carter as weak, as uh, pursuing the wrong-headed policy of detente, and really situates Reagan and his aggressive confrontation with the Soviet Union in a way that will jive with American voters. In response to the Iranian hostage crisis, Jimmy Carter would attempt to plot, plan, and execute a rescue miss mission involving the newly created Delta Force, an elite um, group within the American military that was tasked with uh, flying in to the embassy in Tehran and freeing the hostages. This would be the very first action of the newly created Delta Force. Now, later in the class, we'll talk about the movie Delta Force starring Chuck Norris, which dramatizes a very different American effort and invasion, one that resonated with the failure of this first effort by the real Delta Force, known as Operation Eagle Claw. Operation Eagle Claw, cool name, right? Sounds bitchin', right? Eagle Claw, right? was uh, this plan by Carter to free the hostages involving the elite Delta Force, where they would fly into Iran, land near the embassy, invade the embassy, and free the hostages. It sounded cool. It was aggressive. It had this bitchin' name, Operation Eagle Claw, but it turned out to be an absolute disaster. The helicopters were either inoperable or they crashed. One helicopter that was to be involved in this really precise and dramatic invasion that would free the hostages uh, crashed in a sandstorm, killing the Marines on board. So the hostage crisis itself was evidence for many of American weakness, incompetence, impotence. One further example of the decline of the United States, the weakness of the United States, the loss of our standing and power around the globe again, built on many previous events amplified by the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in 1979. And then the response to the Iranian hostage crisis, Operation Eagle Claw, turns out to be an absolute failure. The helicopters crash, the Marines die, and the hostages remain. So you have these layers of tragedy, these layers 
of crisis, all in 1980, a year that we'll see Jimmy Carter square off against Ronald Reagan in his re-election bid. All right, the other ways in which we remained a captive America in 1980 concern a variety of economic woes and troubles in this year, this election year. We've already talked about how the Iranian hostage crisis itself caused a number of economic consequences for the American worker and consumer with the oil shock, the rise in gas prices. Related to that was an overall rise in inflation in 1980 of 18% a huge increase in prices in an economy that was largely centered on consumerism. The American economy in the 20th century becomes a consumer economy and remains to this day. Americans measure the economy, not just in part in regards to employment and their sense of job security, but in regards to prices. And that's why today in 2022 now, uh, rising gas prices are often seen as a, a harbinger of a bad economy, even though employment numbers are good, um, income and wage uh, numbers are up, Americans still perceive the economy as bad because things cost more. And that was certainly the case in 1980, even more dramatically, with an inflation rate of 18%. Uh, there was also a credit crunch in 1980 where a number of loans uh, by prospective borrowers for homes, credit cards were denied as banks contracted and were very concerned about um, credit and extending credit. And so in 1980, uh, there was a credit crunch and that meant that people couldn't borrow money to buy a car, buy a home, open a new line of credit or obtain a new credit card. And with it came a decline in consumer demand. When people couldn't borrow, they couldn't spend. And that was particularly ruinous for an economy that was so centered on consumer spending. So prices are rising. Uh, there's a major uh, oil shock. People are sitting in their cars for hours to buy gasoline. Um, they can't get loans, which means they can't spend money, which meant that businesses were disinclined to invest and um, employ more people in an economy so centered on consumer spending. There were steep declines as a result of the oil shocks in the automobile industry. 1970s is a terrible time for the American auto industry that still was committed to producing large gas guzzling vehicles that had in the 1960s been symbols of decadence, of the American dream, of comfort, GM, Ford, Chrysler, Dodge, they were still producing in the 1970s these large, gas-guzzling, often unreliable automobiles, but were now facing stiff competition from Germany and Japan, which were making smaller, more reliable, fuel-efficient vehicles that American consumers were turning to, particularly with the rising gas prices. Now Americans coveted fuel economy. And what this led to was a decline in fortunes for the American auto industry that was not meeting a new consumer demand that centered on smaller, more fuel efficient, reliable cars. And as American consumers turned to Honda, Toyota, and Volkswagen, it meant declining revenue for Ford, GM, Chrysler. That meant that they closed plants. They laid off their workforce. With declines in the automobile industry, fueled by these trends, came declines in the steel industry because automobiles were made out of steel and so many of their components were made out of steel. And steel was also one of those thriving industries of the mid 20th century that employed people with good paying jobs for people with a high school diploma that allowed them to buy a house and their kids to college. Those jobs are evaporating in the 1970s. The fortunes of steel, of road construction, rubber, tire industry, deeply intertwined. And so when the automobile industry declined, these other industries declined along with them. And this was most acutely felt in large urban areas like Detroit, like Cleveland. And what happens in the 1970s is that as jobs evaporate in those cities, tax revenue 
declines. People aren't working as much, earning as much, spending as much, and that meant there was less money for city services, less money for schools, less money for police departments. And this led to the many crises in urban areas, rising crime, um, a number of problems associated with lack of education funding. And so you get these ripples in a pond effect where what is going sour in the American economy later influences American society and aggrandize and deepens these fears, these anxieties, these sensibilities of an America in decline, an urban crisis, a crisis in regards to crime, a declining opportunity base for Americans, the decline of the great American industrial cities like Detroit and Cleveland. And that's why in 1980, there was a booming business in the doomsday industry, the one industry that thrived in this period. You have best-selling books like the one represented here, Crisis Investing by Douglas Casey, that tried to convince Americans there was opportunity in misery with, as he states here in the subtitle, a coming Great Depression. And this was not uh, alone a singular bestseller. There were many best-selling books along this line. It's much like the Bitcoin mania of today, where everyone perceives an absolute crisis, an absolute doomsday scenario in the future, and goes scrambling for something that could salvage prosperity and opportunity if you just know the right secrets. And so a good analog to our contemporary crisis now in 2021-2022 was the sensibility in 1980, this election year for Carter against Reagan, uh, that there was a coming Great Depression symbolized by all of these developments so active and alive in 1980. So we have foreign policy crises, we have economic woes, and then also in 1980, there was widespread fear in captive America associated with crime and violence. There was a prison riot in Santa Fe in February of 1980, fueled by white supremacist gangs in a penitentiary in Santa Fe that ultimately led to the death of 33 inmates. This was the largest prison riot since the Attica riot of the early 1970s. And it had this racialized element to it as it was the product of white supremacist gains, gain, gangs within this prison that targeted uh, Latino and African American inmates. Then in May of 1980, another racialized form of violence in riots that erupted in Miami when white police officers were uh, exonerated in a case in which they had killed an African American resident of Miami. Many see the now forgotten riots in Miami in May of 1980 as a precursor in many ways to the LA riots or LA insurrection uprising of 1992 because this event in Miami in 1980 uh, was again sparked by the exoneration of police officers who were indicted in the killing of an African-American citizen. And the riots themselves had a racialized element to them because they often manifest in clashes between African-American residents in Miami and Cuban immigrants who had been coming in the 1970s as a result of their efforts to flee the communist regime in Cuba led by Fidel Castro. So the 1970s would see a massive influx of refugees from Cuba, a transition in Miami with the rise of these Cuban immigrants and that is very analogous to what we see in the L.A. uprising or L.A. riots of 1992, when so many of the clashes here in Los Angeles in 1992 were in places like Koreatown, where African-Americans clashed with Korean immigrants. In May of 1980, in Miami, in these riots, there were many clashes between African-Americans and Cuban immigrants, where African-Americans saw these Cuban immigrants moving into Miami and displacing them and as economic threats to the African-American community there. So there's all of these different connections, but ultimately what happened was a massive event in Miami in 1980 marked by violence, property destruction, death, the worst urban insurrection since 1968, all of it perceived as menacing and threatening 
to Americans in 1980. There were a number of other government scandals in 1980. There was the Abscan scandal that involved politicians in New Jersey. There was the My Porn scandal, which involved organized crime in Miami, the scene of the deadly riots of May of 1980. Um, the my porn scandal involved uh, the mafia, its control of pornography. This scandal in particular represented a threat to Americans who were fearful of the greater licentiousness that came in the 1970s in regards to the legalization of pornography. We'll talk later in the class about the cultural conservative movement of the 1980s, the evangelical movement, crusade against pornography. And so the My Porn scandal was a scandal that confirmed fears, particularly among born again Christians, evangelicals, cultural conservatives, that there was a great crisis of morality in America where there were these um, leagues of uh, mafia types conspiring with um, the pornography industry to promulgate this fear this threat to the American family. So also in 1980, in addition to these incidences, there were the uh, murders that in particular threatened American children. There were the Atlantic child murders. There were a series of murders of black children in Atlanta and a massive manhunt for the serial killer responsible for that. Uh, there were all kinds of sensationalistic stories of, again, cults and pedophile networks. The QAnon conspiracy that has prevailed in America over the last few years has its precursors in 1980 and through 1980s America, as we'll talk about later in the various fears that prevailed, particularly regarding children in the 1980s with the rise of the um, milk carton and the missing phenomenon. Um, that comes out of the late 70s and in particular 1980, a series of stories involving ab 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 abduction and killing of children. There were the Atlantic chi Atlanta child murders, there were all sorts of stories of satanic cults, pedophile networks. In 1980, John Wayne Gacy was put on trial for his mass murders. And so wherever you looked in 1980, there were these media reports of nefarious dark forces that were targeting American children. James Baldwin, the acclaimed African-American writer, wrote a book about the Atlanta child murders, which were again a series of murders that targeted African-American children in that city with the title, The Evidence of Things Not Seen. And that title is a perfect metaphor for the sense of fear in America in 1980 that often circulated around things unseen of nefarious forces within American society, satanic cults, a pornography network, a dark forces of corruption. The events of 1980, the events in Miami, in Santa Fe, the events that prevailed in a sensationalistic media culture that often centered on stories of serial killers and sex, violent cults, further confirmed in the American imagination that America was in a very dangerous, captive position. And then in May of 1980, Mount St. Helens erupts. Now, it was hard to blame Jimmy Carter for Mount St. Helens, a natural disaster, but it was yet another catastrophe in this fateful year. And when it erupts, it confirms a lot of belief within apocalyptic type thinking Americans, particularly within the cultural conservative and Christian movement that the end was indeed near. So all of this builds toward the election of November of 1980. Going into that election, Jimmy Carter had a high disapproval rating, where in July of 1980, 77% of Americans disapproved of his efforts as president. Reagan, in contradistinction, represented himself as a paragon of optimism. He talked about a chance for American renaissance and renewal, 
his campaign slogan in 1980 was, no lie, this is true, make America great again. Yes, Reagan came up with that phrase. Trump stole that phrase. Reagan was the first to campaign on that slogan, make America great again. And so Reagan represented himself as a paragon of optimism. He talked about his small town upbringing, he talked about uh, the virtues of hard work, and he represented Carter, liberals, as those dark nefarious forces that were committed to American decline. Reagan criticized Carter as responsible for the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, the Iranian hostage crisis and the revolution, all of which he saw as stemming from a vague sense of Carter as weak or incompetent. Reagan was very comfortable in speaking in terms, Manichaean, black and white, of good and evil, representing America as inherently good, betrayed now by these liberals and fear mongers like Carter in contradistinction to the evil forces, whether they were communism or now these new threats that were symbolized by the fundamentalist revolution in Iran. Carter had already been weakened by a primary challenge from within the Democratic Party, Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy had run for the Democratic nomination against the sitting president, the Democratic president, Jimmy Carter. So Carter had already endured a primary challenge Carter is running for re-election in 1980, and usually incumbent presidents win. It's one of the great truths of American politics that incumbents usually win. To defeat an incumbent, you usually need a third party challenge, a major economic crisis, or now we can add to that a pandemic because Trump, of course, loses in 2020 as an incumbent. But usually incumbents win. What ultimately accounts for their defeat a primary challenge, that was the case with Carter in 1980, also the case with George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992, who we'll talk about at the very end of this class with the onset of the Clinton era, when Bill Clinton defeated a incumbent president, George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992. George Herbert Walker Bush had also endured a primary challenge from within his party when Pat Buchanan ran for the Republican nomination in 1992. Buchanan doesn't get the nomination in 1992. Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, doesn't get the Democratic nomination in 1980, but his campaign against Carter weakened Carter. And then there was a third party candidate. John Anderson ran for president as well in 1980. And he ran as a moderate, sort of in between Carter and Reagan. And he won many votes that likely would have gone to Carter. There will also be a 30 third party challenge against George Herbert Walker Bush in 1992 in the form of the billionaire H. Ross Perot. So these are very common as forces that work to weaken an incumbent president and account for the rare instances in which they are defeated. You need a third party candidate, you need a primary challenge, or as in the case of 1932, a major economic crisis, or 2020, a pandemic. Carter was weakened by the primary challenge from Kennedy, the third party challenge from Anderson, and then just days before the election, there was the one and only debate between Carter and Reagan in Cleveland in October of 1980. Carter had refused to debate Reagan, but ultimately conceded to the one and only televised debate between the two. And Reagan, very telegenic as a former TV star, movie star, was very effective in his efforts against Carter in this debate that drew upon the dynamics we've talked about here, of representing Carter as a force of negativity, pessimism, decline, austerity, urging the American people that the problem lie within the nation rather than, again, identifying a them, a force of evil that could be blamed for America's defeat and decline. Reagan was very adroit, very skilled in playing into that. When Carter would cite some of the problems or challenges in the nation, Reagan replied with what would ultimately be one of his most famous lines and often employed by those impersonating him, there you go again. When Car Carter argues that there are these challenges within the nation, Reagan says, there you go again, basically saying, 
you're wrong because you're admitting that there are these challenges. You're wrong because you are so alarmist and defeatist. There you go again with your acknowledgement of reality. There you go again with your acknowledgement that we do indeed face challenges. Reagan said, it doesn't matter. We can defeat them. We can go forward. We can be triumphant. We can make America great again. And then Reagan asked another pointed question that survives to this day as really the question often cited by pollsters, pundits, in regards to how Americans choose to vote. Are you better off than you were four years ago? And when Reagan offers that question in the one and only debate where he is directly challenging Carter, Americans thought about where they were in this year of 1980, a year of economic woes, a year of fear and violence, a year of yet another setback abroad. Operation Eagle Claw had failed. Hostages still in blindfolds held in Tehran. And for many Americans, that question led to an emphatic no. And with it, they were willing to take a risk and vote for this former TV star, governor of California, Ronald Reagan. Reagan won 51 to 41. The other votes here, the other percentages going towards Anderson, who again, most observers argued stole votes away from Carter. Reagan won 44 states, including states that today we see as blue states like California. The Republican Party made major gains in the House, gaining 33 seats, and they came to control the Senate for the first time since 1952. So Reagan won clearly, he won emphatically, and he won largely because his argument, his representation of Carter and the problems in the nation so fit with the experiences of the United States in 1980. Reagan, conservatives, won because their message fit with an America besieged by economic woes, a perception of American decline abroad, fear, crime, violence in American streets. Reagan represented an America that could do as it pleased, a sort of John Wayne foreign policy where we could use American authority and power again to reclaim American prominence. And we'll talk a lot about that element of 1980s America, that effort to eradicate what was thought of as the Vietnam syndrome and restore America's faith in our military prowess and how that manifests in movies like Rambo, those of Chuck Norris. So Reagan was really good at reviving that idea that America could exert its power abroad, that we weren't limited that we did not have to accept more losses like those in Vietnam and the crisis in Iran. He painted Carter as pessimistic, resigned to American decline, blaming the American people rather than those forces around the globe. For Carter, many perceived the problem as stemming from within the American nation. Observers argued for Carter, the problem was us. And for Reagan, the problem was the them of them that could be the Soviets, communism, the Iranians, liberals, the Carter administration. One of the ways in which the Reagan era really presages the America we live in today is by defining an amorphous them. Today you'll hear conservatives and others talk about the elites in the same fashion or other dark nefarious forces that they don't name, that aren't specific, but serve as a boogeyman for all the reasons why America seems to be in decline. Reagan pioneered that effort and really successfully employed it against Carter. In 1980, the American hockey team defeated uh, the Soviets and won the gold medal in those Winter Olympics and probably what's known as the miracle on ice. And the crowd observing this chanted, USA, USA, USA. 1980, patriotism was back in vogue and it was admirable now to believe in your country, to see its possibilities. And that again played into Reagan's image and indictment of Carter. 
So in 1980, Ronald Reagan wins the presidency and ushers in the decade that is our focus in this class. At the very end of that year, John Lennon is killed in New York City. And for many, that symbolized the end of an era, the end of the 60s in a new era, dawning, one that, as we'll see, will continue the sense of fear, the sense of American decline, but now interlaced with optimism, hope, a sense of American renewal. It's really the tension and interplay we'll see throughout this class manifest in many ways and many of the primary sources we'll examine, both read and watched. The sense that America was both simultaneously a nation under siege, but a nation of great power and opportunity. With, Reag with Reagan's election, with the terrible assassination of John Lennon, it seemed as if America had reached a turning point in this year of 1980. A new decade, a new era beckoned. I hope you've enjoyed this first lecture. I hope we will soon be back in class together. I hope you'll enjoy all the lectures in this class, the movies we'll watch and walk away after this quarter with a good understanding of America in the 1980s. Welcome everyone, History 30 this quarter.